So Senate Government Operations, it is Tuesday, April 20th, 0420, and here we are. Um, some of you got that, some of you didn't, but anyway, <laughs> we are here and um, we're going to be talking about retirement. And today we're going to focus on the governance part of it. And I, um, I, I did it a little later than I had hoped, but I had a few questions that I thought I would post so that if, as people are talking about it, they can um, keep those questions in mind. I didn't get questions from any other committee members. So I, uh, Gail went ahead and posted the ones that I have, and I believe they are on our committee page now. Is that right, Gail? Yes. Yes, okay. they are. And there were just a few of them, but as you're going through your testimony, if you just, um, then I don't have to ask those questions afterwards. You can address them while you're talking to us. So I think um, with that, what we'll do is we'll get started with um, Mr. Galanka and um, Mr. Henry, are you here on behalf of the treasurer, you are uh, muted. I was uh, really here on behalf of VPIC with uh, Chairman Golanka. Okay, all right. So I'll let you start us off here and talk to us about why this is structured the way it is and what we should be looking at. And we've had, we, just for people information, we have had a walkthrough of it. So we've had our technical, Correction, um, answer, questions answered. But if you would walk us through the, the um, suggestion to change the V the V pick and how that would work, that would great, be great. Thank you. You want me to start, Madam Chair? Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you, and thank you for having me back. Uh, I apologize for having to leave the last last week's meeting a little bit early because I had a pre-existing uh, pre-scheduled meeting. Um, but I can give you my perspective on, on these changes as how we develop them. I know Representative Gannon is here as well, and I know we work very closely with the House GovOps Committee in terms of this process. Um, I'll give you a little history. You know, obviously, the, uh, there was the initial proposal for the Vermont Retirement Commission that was proposed by the House GovOps Committee. So Beth and I replied to that with our recommendations, which uh, I've put all these documents on the Senate GovOps uh, a web page under my name so you can look at them and you can get to yourself the history of I basically just copied everything that we had given to House GovOps uh, from both Beth Pierce as well as myself in comments and how this thing developed and so uh, a working group of Beth and myself and some other interested parties would get together and we went over the initial proposal and we put down 16 different items which we thought would be helpful for GovOps in the House to uh, to look at and consider as they drafted any legislation in regards to VPIC. So with that, Representative Gannon took that um, and developed the bill. You'll notice in there, I also have some follow-up emails from VPIC. There was a VPIC meeting in the meantime where we looked that over, we looked over the proposed legislation. They approved those uh, recommended changes un unanimously. We left off at that time the discussion on uh, uh, term limits. Um, uh, because we felt that was a little bit uh, out of our, uh, we didn't have time enough really to cover it during our VPIC meeting at that time. And there wasn't unanimous consent on that. So I wanted to give the House a feeling of well, what ideas on this proposed bill were unanimously approved by VPIC or unanimously endorsed by VPIC. And then uh, the other issue was uh, whether or not legislators should sit on the, uh, the commission and we left that issue off as well. Um, so you can kind of see some of the different emails back and forth in regards to specific questions that came up. There was a, a follow-up email from me, which finalized some of the final terms and some of the nuanced terms and reasons why VPIC and uh, uh, the treasurer and I felt that they were important to slightly alter some of Rep Representative Gannon's uh, initial uh, bill. So from that, they came out with a bill, and, and I think it, it truly represents a good representation of both the House uh, GovOps Committee work as well as uh, Treasurer Pierce and myself. Uh, and we think it's a really good uh, step in the direction of uh, uh, making v VPIC more of an independent uh, entity that works alongside the Treasurer's Office instead of inside it. 
Um, I asked Eric Henry to join us because he's our new chief investment officer that we've had for the past two and a half or three years now, mm -hmm. Eric. I'm not really, time flies when you're having fun. Um, I think we've made tremendous progress on BPIC. And I think these changes really help us, I believe, get to the next level. So I haven't had a chance yet to read your questions, um, but I can pull them up. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you what they were right now. Okay. The, um, the I, I just, uh, let's see, there's only one, there's a definition of independent, but as far as I can tell, there's only one place where it's used and that's, um, on the, an individual shall be considered independent pursuant to this if, um, that's the only place I found any place that talked about independent person. We wanted to have it in there. We limited it to, um, I think it's the governor's appointees uh, to make sure that, because the, the problem was when we tried to limit other members um, with 50,000 beneficiaries, Mm -hmm. and limiting it to in-laws and brothers and parents and siblings, you pretty quickly get to everyone in the state. And so we, yeah. we limited that definition to strictly the govern, governor's appointees at this point. Oh, okay. All right. And I did have a question about what does it mean to be somebody servicing the plan? I mean, that's just a technical. I'd interpret that as being like an investment consultant, a, a money manager, maybe the actuary, uh, some of the okay. private vendors we have. We have a proxy voting uh, a relationship with an outside vendor. Um, so it seems to be the vendors that we hire uh, at VPIC. Okay. And then very kind of a stupid technical question I had is the chair is appointed by the other members, but there's no qualifications for what the chair should be. But then if the chair leaves, the vice chair does not become the chair. And instead, there's an interim chair appointed, and that person has to be a financial expert and independent. But the chair didn't have to be to begin with. And I just wondered why. I'll leave that to Representative Gannon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, uh, Senator White, for asking that, because that's one of my questions as well, is why are we requiring this of others, but not of the chair, who is so important to have these expertise? Senator Polina? Well, just to continue that question, it's the same kind of question. How do nine people point somebody that it's just wide open? Like these nine people haven't necessarily met yet. They have to meet each other and they have to pick somebody else to be their leader. It just seems like a pretty wide open process. Well, that's how it's worked right now. So VPIC right now is structured. So the uh, six members of VPIC at this point elect the chair and they elect me through an annual process. Um, we also go through an annual review process that's set up through VPIC policy. Um, I, I think it works very well. You know, they, they do hire, you know, we had a, a vetting process. Uh, I put my name in that. I used to be a member of VPIC through my relationship with Veeamers. Um, but I think it brings at that point the level of expertise and it's actually a spokesperson for VPIC as well. So I think there's a multitude of reasons that the, the committee members might want to chair. I think mainly it's to represent them in, in places like this, as well as uh, to reporters, as well as to help facilitate uh, the meeting. Uh, and, and I think it, it it's not just financial expertise. I think it's a combination of skill sets that they're looking for. But the chair is not appointed from among those other nine members. No. The chair is no. appointed by those nine members. That's correct. Okay. So... Um, maybe Representative Gannon, if you can just tell me very quickly why the chair initially doesn't have to be somebody with those qualifications and why the vice chair doesn't take over and why the new interim chair would have to have those qualifications. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, Representative John Gannon from Wilmington. And I I'll have to be honest, I believe that was an oversight, Madam Chair. I, I believe that the chair should be independent okay. and initial expert. Okay. All right. We're glad that's good to know. So thank you. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, and, can I? Yeah, yes, Senator Rahm. Well, I guess while, while we're going back and forth, I mean, what problem would that be solving in your mind from the existing way it's done? Well, right I mean, now. If someone's supported by the rest of the committee to be chair, there could be a number of reasons that's the case, that they're a good leader, that they listen to everyone. So I'm just curious what problem it's solving. Well, the problem it's solving is the lack that there was no requirement for financial expertise or independence. Um, so I think if you look at some of the research out of the Boston College Center for Retirement Research, you'll see that having um, 
a mix of people with financial expertise on, on a pension board is very important towards that performance. And so that was but the reason see, that we moved there. But as chair, I mean, which is more well, of a leadership role. Well, I will have to say, I mean, if you look at um, the, the, the leadership under um, Chair Galanka, I mean, the financial performance of the pick of the in pension plans has picked up. Um, and um, they've looked at fees. I think it's important that there is a financial expert leading um, VPIC because that is its mission, is to ensure um, that the, the, the pension investments are performing well um, and that we're setting an assumed rate of return um, that, is, that is not overly optimistic. And under Chair Galanka, they have achieved those things. Uh, I mean, it, it, is, it, it is amazing to me the, the dramatic turnaround with VPIC under his leadership. Okay, um, Senator Clarkson. Thank you, uh, John. I have to say it's, it's it, that's good to know that it was just a, a, an oversight because you guys did such good work on this generally. Um, so I, I think that it's important to have financial expertise, but uh, but I think Senator Rahm is right. It also a leader. There obviously need to be good skills that that Tom himself referred to uh, leadership skills. So we can I think craft that. Uh, in a way that would be additive and and uh, a little more fulsome. But financial expertise is certainly one of the many skills and talents that uh, that the chair should have. Uh, leadership skills, uh, good interpersonal skills, and good financial skills. All three are really important. And then I I, the, senator. the only other question, kind of, uh, nitpicky question I had is explain to me again about why in some places it's an independent board and in one place it's a standalone board. Why isn't it consistently either an independent or a standalone? Well, this is or new is language. It? So the goal is to move towards independence. So it, it right. formally or in the current law, it's, it's, it, it's a part of the treasurer's staff and treasurer's office. So we're moving <laughs> towards the independence. I get that, I get that. And it's, that's what it says. Yeah. But when it talks about the um, the uh, consultant being hired, it talks about the consultant transferring it to a standalone entity. And that's my only question. Why use standalone as opposed to independent? Is that just a, a technical? I, I believe that's just a technical. Okay. Know, All it's right. the okay. same meaning. Um, the consultant is going to look at, well, how are we going to accomplish okay. the goals that right. we're looking for now? Yeah, no, 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 I, I, I got that. I just wanted to make sure that we were being consistent with our words. So, Senator Clarkson. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I guess my, uh, uh, are we just talking, are, are we able to ask all questions about governance at the moment, or are we still? Yeah, yeah no, I, what I'd like to do, though, is um, have other people weigh in before we get too deeply into the questions to hear what the what um, the VSEA, the VTA and um, NEA, right. so, what so their, their comments about it. I look forward to that as well. I just, uh, as we're talking about sort of how things are defined and, and what things are still needed. We talk about uh, what, the, what expenses are uh, paid for by the funds and shared equally in the funds. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, uh, I found that the um, uh, Chris Roop's fiscal note was very useful as I went through this bill to uh, to look at, and um, the, all the costs and per diems and expense reimbursements are identified as being covered by the various funds equitably, but it doesn't mention the salaries uh, for the for the four professionals, the yeah. the chair and the three uh, uh, other paid. Uh, professionals. So I was just curious, I, how are they being paid? Are they being paid also out of the retirement funds? And sure, sure, Sen Senator, let me, in your, I, I uploaded a document that I'd shared with House CovOps. Um, it's a fee, uh, annual fee review that we did last year. And if you go to page four of that document, um, it lists every All right, single you've got, fee. You, you've got lots and lots of documents here. Which is the name of it? It should be said, it should say VPIC manager and vendor fees annual yes, review. Yeah, for 2020. It's, about, it's about the fifth one down or six. That's yeah. correct. Okay. Now that, that lists every fee we pay that some you see, some you don't. 
whether it comes out of an individual investment management firm that, that charges back into the trust, or if it's the separate consultants. And what you're talking about is investment staff. Yeah. Investment staff is, is lined out there at about $360,000 a year. So right now, we pay our staff, the three staff people, a collective total of about $360,000 in the budget. And that was as of last year. So Beth, you're here too. So maybe you, you, you may know other expenses and other staff that are allocated, but I just use the investment staff that we, uh, and, we look at. And, and Tom, that's shared equitably from all the funds. That's correct, yeah. The same way, the per diem. Okay, great, thanks. Because it wasn't- And it, there's more for pension benefit individuals that work in the treasurer's office. I just listed out the ones that we had here uh, through the investment management side. Great, thanks. Okay, committee, any more questions for Mr. Galanka? Uh, Treasurer Pierce, I um, assume that you're supporting this um, since you and Mr. Galanka worked together on it. Uh, that's correct. I apologize. I had the uh, other Zoom uh, link, so I was waiting to be um, invited in. And so I apologize for the delay in, um, in um, in um, getting here. Uh, yes, I do support it. There were some uh, changes that, uh, that are in memos from uh, Tom uh, that uh, we think are important. Uh, some issues around um, uh, the definition of independence, although we support uh, certainly the, uh, the concept. Uh, I would like to just go back a step. You know, VPIC was created in 2005. And at the time, uh, no one could agree on, you know, who should be on it. It was, uh, it was a mess. And uh, there was a gubernatorial veto um, of VPIC at one point in this. And uh, ultimately, the result was that we had a commission, uh, committee of 17, a committee of the whole. So everybody that was on a board got on. Um, uh, the treasurer at the time was on all three boards. So he only got one vote. But uh, um, it was, uh, it was uh, unwieldy, to say the least. And, uh, and uh, we were concerned, frankly, with the original um, proposal presented to the House that went back to a 15 board uh, group it, uh, with a two tiered structure. It was unwieldy and it created some, it was cumbersome so that if uh, you needed, for instance, to fire an investment manager, which we have had to do, and uh, we on an emergency basis when uh, things are, um, um, uh, uh, going apart in the uh, the market, for instance, uh, we've uh, we've needed to do that quickly, and that structure did not allow us to do that. Um, hence, uh, Tom and some discussions with other folks, as well, and, and and myself, we um, we uh, put together what uh, you see primarily in the um, in the um, the House bill. So uh, you uh, you see the pieces that we uh, in one of the memos that was submitted uh, that uh, by Tom and with my support that we do that. And um, so we are in full support of this. Uh, again, I think that um, uh, having the, um, uh, a 10 member board instead of the 15 two tiered structure that we saw is important. I would like to point out when we went from the, the, um, the 17 board, I mean, uh, excuse me, when we went from the three um, retirement boards having um, uh, oversight of the investments to VPIC uh, in 2005, we saved a million dollars in fees. Um, by doing that immediately. And uh, the estimates back at the time, and it's a little difficult to um, uh, to uh, compare apples to apples when you're changing um, um, uh, investments and consolidating, but the estimate at the time was that uh, increased return by about $45 million. Uh, so I think we were on the right track. Uh, in 2008, there were changes to get rid of that 17 member um, uh, construct. Uh, we had a consultant come in. Uh, it uh, uh, he was a um, um, a um, uh, affiliated with uh, University of Oxford and Harvard Law, so uh, I think his credentials were very good. And he came in and did a study, and uh, we made the changes, as I said, to the seven-person board, the six plus the uh, the one that is elected. So it's very similar to now, and we have um, uh, had. Uh, um, an investment chair that's been a professional in, in both cases since the inse inception of, um, of uh, VPIC. Um, we, um, uh, again, I think that this current structure is, is very good. Uh, you know, and as we look forward, I think that uh, Tom has done a fantastic job and I think you should get a lot of credit for that. 
Um, over time, we've um, done a number of things. Uh, we've simplified the portfolio. Uh, um, and again, I should, uh, I have one vote in it, but I, uh, the committee as a whole and with the Tom's leadership, we've used uh, more passive management uh, where it makes sense. We've reduced fees. We've increased transparency and we've added staff. Uh, one of the comments I've made in, in numerous um, uh, testimonies to the legislature is we should have at least one staff per billion. And at 5.3 billion, we're not there yet. Um, but I think we're, you know, we recognize that VPIC is growing. Uh, the economies of scale, when we looked at this in 2008, weren't there to spin off VPIC. But I believe very strongly that it's time. Uh, to build on those successes and to, um, to um, uh, have VPIC stand alone. Uh, we are going to need to make some budgetary changes. Unfortunately, given the timeframes on this, we're not able to, uh, I don't believe in the, at, the, at the pace that uh, the appropriations bill is moving uh, to make some budgetary changes this year. But I would uh, hope that we could put some language in there about the intent to do that and to make that move after the consultant study in, uh, in 2000 and um, um, in, in fiscal year 2023. I um, would also point out getting this question about investment staff um, and how that is, um, uh, how the expenses are allocated. Uh, we have, a, since 2005, we've had a, um, a timesheet allocation process in the office. So the staff, for instance, in retirement um, uh, will record how much time they've spent in um, defined benefit with the state, how much in defined benefit for the uh, teachers, the DC plan and so on. Um, and I do the same um, on, a, um, on an aggregate basis um, I, uh, uh, as well as other staff. And uh, so that, for instance, 18% of my time or something might be related to investments. Um, I don't have the figures in front of me. So that time is allocated uh, to the, um, uh, to, to the uh, pension systems. And that time is total. Um, the time for, uh, uh, in each system uh, would be allocated to some extent to, uh, to, to VPIC. Uh, we allocate on the basis of assets under management for the purposes of investment funds. Uh, for the purposes of, um, of other pension expenses, retirement, counseling, and the like, it's a three-part piece. Uh, assets, uh, time, um, and uh, the number of the population of each plan. And uh, we developed that, as I said, some years back. So that, that will get to the point. So we're going to have to disaggregate some of that, and that will take a little time. And we want to see the consultant report. But I think that... Um, um, it um, uh, uh, makes some sense. And again, I want to compliment Tom and, and the VPIC as a whole in, in the numbers that we've had. Now, when you say numbers, everything's endpoint sensitive in, in investments. Uh, you know, you have different economic cycles, you know, whether you hit it in a boom or whether you hit it uh, in a recession period, whether it uh, fixed income is doing well versus equities. Um, but our numbers right now uh, for the period ending 12, 31, 20, we're in the top third of the country uh, for our seven-year returns in the top 19% for our one, three, and five-year returns. And you have to be careful. As I said, it's endpoint sensitive. I saw one published report that said that uh, took the period of 2008 to 2018. And frankly, that included the Great Recession. And so you would expect some, uh, some uh, uh, not so great numbers. Our 10-year numbers from a performance side, I don't know, uh, Tom, off the top of my head, whether we hit the 7% in the 10-year numbers. I know we did in, in the others. Through, but, through uh, December, we were at 7.24%. For the 10 years. It, it was the bottom 70th percentile. So we, you, yeah. show, you show the improvement, but it was still 7.24% at the end of yeah. December 31st. So we did, we did exceed our, um, um, our uh, assumed rate of return at that point. And when I take a look at the five-year period uh, or 10-year period, we have five above, five below. Um, so you're in a period uh, of the assumed rate of return. A um, couple of those low points were um, uh, tough times in the market, the, uh, the, uh, the meltdown in China um, and Brexit, which both of those happened in, in, at the end of June. It never fails it, as you're looking at this thing. And the measurement point is June 30th. The market will recover after that. But uh, um, it, 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 it does, as I said, it is an endpoint uh, sensitive. And again, I think that um, you know, over the years, we've taken a critical look at the governance structure. We've made changes. Um, it's time to make this change now. Again, we build on our successes, build on the last several years. And again, um, I also want to compliment uh, the staff that we've had in the office um, in the leadership of the last two CIOs, Matt Considine and, um, and Eric Henry. Eric is on the call here. Um, 
as far as the professionalism goes, and I know there's been a lot of co comment, I would support uh, the, the the current bill that says that the uh, that the chair should be a um, um, a um, expert. Um, I do believe that the vice chair will be there and can be um, can and add to that leadership. Um, but uh, given given the complexities of the market and the, the role that a director, excuse me, a uh, chair would take, I think that it's important to have an expert. Now we do now. And I would point out, I took a look at our board construct right now, and we have uh, a pretty pretty darn good board. We have um, the chair who's a registered investment advisor, and uh, I'd let Tom elaborate on his great credentials if, uh, if you'd like to hear those. Um, I love the great school in Notre Dame. I thought I'd throw that in, Tom. Um, but um, uh, we also have an, the, a gubernatorial appointment that is also a registered investment advisor. The second gubernatorial um, appointment is a C, was a CF, C, CEO of a major company for many, many years. Uh, one member of the employees um, and uh, we think about that and say, well, you know, they, they're employee um, members and they are, and they have the, they, I think they add value and a diff good perspective to the board. But one member has a degree in math and an MBA in finance. Uh, uh, one of the other three has a, a degree in finance. I might be an MBA. I don't want to, uh, I believe that's the case. And the third member has a long history of uh, years of experience with VPIC and has taken the, the, the training that we have. And I've been doing this work for 40 plus years. So I, you know, I think I know something about the game as well. That said, you could have a different governor and a different treasurer that, uh, that have more politics in mind than investments. And, uh, you know, we, I think we've been very nonpartisan. I, 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 uh, again, I think that the qualifications of these board members is very good. People spend time thinking about that, but it could be a different case in the future. And codifying this, put it into statute that you need that type of expertise and board members. And I think that that is important that they would represent 30% uh, of the total as well as the employer members that are appointed by, by various groups. I think that it's a good combination. I think it codifies that. And I would go back to the BC study that uh, Representative Gannon pointed out. Uh, it also says beyond the professionals, it says you should have skin in the game by employee representatives too. The 15 board member um, uh, concept that was originally produced over and, um, and presented to the house had um, board members three out of 15. And uh, I think that was a little light. And I think three out of 10 is a, is a good place. Uh, I know I'm talking a long time on this because I think these are salient points, but I do support the bill in concept. I think that some of the proposed changes that we had um, have submitted make sense. And uh, we would urge that those be included. But um, as, um, uh, VPIC has also supported this in a special uh, meeting to uh, in concept as well. So I think that uh, we should move forward on this. And I would urge the changes in the um, that, that have been recommended, but I think the concept is great and uh, appreciate the time. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I do, I do have one, two kind of general questions. First of all, is the chair a voting member? It doesn't say. The chair would not be a voting member. Okay, except and I think that... Yeah, would, I, I yeah. think that should be made clear. Yeah, that and, the chair is not members. I'm sorry, Senator. I was going to say, with nine members, uh, if they're all present, it's not likely that we'll have a tie. But there, there are right. cases when it may happen. Yes, but, I don't think I've ever voted in the five. Okay. I, I just think we need to make it clear because it okay. does say for the others that they're ex officio voting members, mm -hmm. and the others are assumed to be voting members. So I just think we need to make that clear. And why mm -hmm. did we choose? Um, looking at the asset and liability study every three years instead of two? Uh, I'll let Tom answer that question as our investment expert. I think that asset liability is extraordinarily important. Um, I don't, um, I guess you could go, I would go either way on that. I, I think that uh, three years is, is, um, is that the oh, asset liability or the experience study? They're talking about experience study. I think that's what I thought. She's that's referencing. What I thought. We, we look yeah. at the assets and liabilities on an annual basis anyway. So we can talk. Eric could, could address okay, it's that. The experience concern. study, yeah. The experience study is where we have to hire an independent or right. we have our actuary run the uh, experience. And that's, that's a more ex expensive and intensive sort of review of the, the different levers right. that, uh, that make up the pension plan. So we, we lowered it from five to three. And I think that's there a good fix. Any more than yeah. that would be a little bit cumbersome every single okay. year. Yes. Okay. Okay, other questions of, um, yes, Senator Rahm? Um, maybe you touched on this briefly, but 
can you tell me what the previous practice was to now with determining the actuarial rate of return? I think before they had to consult, the VPIC had to consult with the other three governing boards and now they wouldn't. Can you speak more to that change? Certainly. So um, the uh, pre-VIGPIC, by the way, each board hired its own actuary. Uh, thankfully, it was the same one, but you could you could end up with a different uh, uh, different scenario. Uh, and in fact, they had different investment advisors uh, at one point. Under VPIC, what was created was a, a a joint process, so it's a joint session. So all all three boards in the uh, in in the investment committee are present at the same time, uh, and so each convenes its meeting. And they have the actuary will go over their data. Um, the uh, our investment consultant will will uh, provide their input into the process as well. And then there's a vote by all three boards as well as the um, the um, investment committee. They have to agree under that model. Um, and if they did not agree, um, you would not make a change to the assumption, which I think is a, was a uh, not a very good uh, construct. Um, Right now, we had a 7.5% uh, rate of return. We really needed to move that down. And uh, if, if we did not have agreement by our three boards in the VPIC, it would not change. You'd still be at the 7.5, which, um, um, which would result in, um, in, in having an unfunded liability that wasn't representative of where we think it should be. Uh, so I think that moving the, the investment committee are the experts on investments. They're the experts on the economic data in terms of inflation, for instance. So we believe that, um, that they should be the, um, the um, board or committee that, um, that uh, weighs in on the, those, those economic factors. But the, the boards would continue to, um, to employ the actuary uh, for the purposes of looking at other types of, um, of um, uh, pieces that are a part of the actuarial assumptions, mortality, uh, retirement experience, staff turnover, staff salaries, um, uh, 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 disabilities, uh, and the other, so that they would retain the responsibility for the non-economic um, uh, uh, actuarial assumptions. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. So, so, so I, my lingering question still is the number of um, employee representatives would still drop about 12 and a half percent, right? Going from four out of, ten, four, what is it? Three out of 10. Three out of 10. Instead of three out of seven. Three out of seven, that's correct. Um, it's well within the range of the BC study, um, and it is certainly an improvement over the, the original proposal submitted to the House of 15 members. Uh, we think it's representative. You also have three independent members that are um, that are selected by the um, uh, the the, um, from, uh, the the League of Cities, the T, uh, the Vermont. Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the correct term for the uh, for the um, Education Association, and uh, the third one is a um, uh, for the state would be an ex officio, the uh, Commissioner of Finance, uh, and. Uh, I think that uh, overall it's a good mix. So you got three, three, and then three, um, um, including um, uh, um, including um, uh, the uh, the the um, secretary, uh, the commissioner of finance. So the governor would have two appointees, and that would be an ex officio appointee. So the governor would have two. Um, the, um, the the employees would have three. The, um, the employees uh, or the boards themselves would have uh, three. And, um, and then you, um, so, um, uh, and plus myself to equal the nine. So two, the governor has two plus, and then there's one that's part of the employer. Um, it does, my interpretation of, of the current statute, and I would support this, is that it's not necessary for the boards to elect a member of their committee. In other words, the, the members of the committee, the employee and the uh, retirees, um, the, the, um, uh, in the case of the municipal, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, officials that are on that, excluding the treasurer in all three cases, uh, would, uh, could elect someone who's not a member of the board. Um, and uh, that's the case now. We have um, uh, two, two of the elected employee representatives that are, 
is selected by employees, um, but um, are um, uh, folks that um, are no longer serving on the um, on the uh, retirement boards, uh, and theoretically, uh, and both, as I said, two out of the, the those uh, two out of the three, the three total, have significant finance experience. So. Um, it's not necessary that they pick one of their own members, uh, and I think that's a good idea. They may look out and say, you know, this person who works with the um, uh, works with the uh, employee boards testifies, or we're, we're familiar with with um, him or her from our. I, I usually say her or him uh, through our um, employee um, 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 groups uh, would have the qualifications to serve on the board and would be a good good member. Thank you. So um, our, can we jump to, I'm gonna to jump to Jeff Fannin. If he is there, I see his name and I see his little microphone off. So Jeff. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Jeff, Fan, for the record, Jeff Fannin, Vermont and EA. Uh, thank you for giving me a few minutes to talk about um, uh, the VPIC governance uh, structure. Um, <clears throat> So it, it, as the treasurer just pointed out, this is an improvement over the 15 uh, person board, VPIC board that was originally contemplated. Uh, however, I think there's some refinements that can, can be made that would improve, improve the, uh, the structure. Um, so, you know, both Representative Gannon and the treasurer spoke about the Boston College report. It, it, um, I would have, and I did testify in the house that the Boston College report I would suggest supports the current structure of VPIC. Um, we have seven members, uh, three of whom are uh, employee members or plan participants, if you will, and four are non-plan participants. Um, and fewer rather than more elected officials. The, the Boston College report also talked about not having too many elected officials on it. Um, and we've added to that. So actually, uh, Madam Treasurer, the, the, the governor now has three appointees. Uh, whereas before he only had two. So he, the governor's picked up an appointee. Um, his, his appointee is the Department of Financial Regulation Commissioner. Um, so that's picked up. Um, so I think you know, that's one, and I testified about that in the House. So we didn't think that was right. We thought that that pick should be removed. Um, I also still, you know, again, in the House, I testified as, I'm not sure why the VPIC chair should have a 20 year uh, term limit seems awfully long. And one of the criticisms of any board is that people who stay too long on any board get too cozy with their investment advisors, uh, the staff, whomever. And that cozy relationship often uh, gets in the way of anybody asking the tough and critical questions that a board member needs to ask of staff and of consultants. And, and so by lengthening the term or you know, giving them a 20 year term limit, it, we just think is too long and, and actually could uh, work to the, you know, I, there's been much about independence and financial expertise and, and uh, being distant, if you will. I think this goes in the absolute wrong direction and the chair should have the same term limit as all the other members of the board. Um, I, I, let's see. Um, and, you know, as just an overall uh, comment, we think that there needs to be balance in the, in the VPIC board. Uh, and that would be balanced between planned participants and non-planned participants. And that's how we see it is, is not necessarily uh, employer or employee. It's who's in the plan and who's not in the plan. And so that, that's the, the balance that we're seeking to obtain and think is important for VPIC. Many boards in the ERISA world, in fact, all boards in a multi-employer uh, arrangement are um, equal number of employee and employer representatives. And I think that's that has bode well for them in large measure. I used to work in that arena uh, and, and you get decisions, you, you get decisions that are hard fought sometimes, but eventually people get around to agreeing with the other side, if you will, because you have to make decisions that everybody knows it and it's tough. Um, so I think that's why there's great value in having that struggle and then getting to a consensus where people uh, agree with, with the, the direction. So I think that's why we're seeking balance in plan participant and, and non plan participant. Um, so, you know, I think that's you know, the, the sum of, of the testimony. Um, oh, I'm sorry, on, uh, I don't wanna give you a page number because that will be wrong, I'm sure. Um, 
but in section uh, was it? Uh, 523, which on mine is page 11 of the bill of um, 449, uh, section of D, subsection D, policies. And I said this in the house, and I think it was, it's later written, but it wasn't caught where I was thinking it should go. The commission shall formulate written policies and procedures deemed necessary to appropriate and appropriate to carry out its functions, et cetera. Uh, I thought it was necessary to put in written, so it was clear. Where are you again, Jeff? Um, yeah, that, I it's knew. On page it. eleven uh, of four H four four nine, it's page eleven, top of the page D, line three, under policies. Assuming you're on the same, it's a pagination the same way. That's oh, right, well, Senator Clarkson. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 well, that's anyway where you are. Whether it's okay, well, it's page eleven of four four nine. I'll, uh, I'll catch up. Where it says uh, the commission shall formulate, and Jeff is saying written policies as opposed to just okay. formulate policies. Yep. I worry about people having policies that are, that are not written down, and, and it's hard for anybody, you know, God forbid the pickle truck takes somebody out. We want policies to be written uh, to, to make sure that we have we know what they are. Yep. yep. What about the ice cream truck? The pickle well, truck sounds pretty sour. <laughs> It's from a former uh, colleague of mine who's called the pickle truck. You never know when the pickle truck's coming. Um, so, but, you know, and that's why you want policies to be written down so that we all know what they are. I think it's, it's just important. Uh, call me a lawyer, but sometimes that's important. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll cede the remainder of my time to my colleagues, uh, Mike O'Neill and Steve Howard. I'm sure they have some other additions that I missed. You don't have to seed time. We have time. Okay. <laughs> but I can. I'm just going to ask you how yeah. you would change the makeup. So we have three um, members from the retirement boards, and we have two employers of of them. Do you consider DFR an employer, or to represent I, the employer? Again, I see them as as planned participant and non-planned participant. So in this case, the commissioner of DFR, Mike Pichak, who I think is listed as a possible witness later on, um, is appointed to his job by the governor. Right. Um, so I, you know, that's that's where I get to three. The governor now has three appointments to VPIC, whereas before, yeah. or in the current law, he, the governor has two. Um, and I, I see that, you know, the, the governor's appoint, appointments, whether it's the Two up front in section, you know, subsection four or seven, the commissioner of DFR, they're non-plant participants. So what the balance I'm, you know, striving for is a, a balance between planned participant and non-planned participant. So, I guess um, my question around that would be just what uh, the treasurer was talking about is that the, for example, the Vistas board could appoint somebody to VPIC that was not a member and was not a plan <clears throat> participant. So then that would skew the balance there again. I mean, I, I don't know how you would do that so that you say all those three people have to be par plan participants. And I, my understanding is that um, a Mike Pichek might be a plan participant. So. <sighs> right. Right. I guess um, if the Visters or Visers uh, employees on that board saw fit to appoint somebody who was not uh, a participant for whatever reason, I think they should be afforded that opportunity to do okay. so. Uh, but that's the, that's the planned participant, if you will, making that appointment, not uh, somebody make it, making it okay. for them, if you will. Yep. Got it. Okay. So you would you would knock out DFR or one of the governor's other appointees? Or do you, uh, yeah. you don't care. Yeah, I just yes, that's correct. I, I don't, and I testified okay. earlier. I didn't I didn't care how you got there. Uh, yep. it, it's just trying to strive for the balance. Yep. Okay. Great. I got that. Any questions for Jeff? All right. So Steve, no, I'm going to go to Mike because Mike was last last time. So Mike. Thank, you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. My name's Mike O'Neill. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Troopers Association. Um, 
I don't think I'll take a lot of time up to today. Um, Jeff, I think has covered a lot of this stuff very well. We're in agreement with the proposals that will you know, bring professionalism and expertise or improvements uh, that would be brought to BPIC. You know, anything that's going to improve the performance of these funds obviously is our interest. Um, one of the problems we've seen over the years, obviously, with the unfunded liability is coming from the performance of these funds. So we support any changes that are going to accomplish that. Our concern is exactly what Jeff just talked about, is the balance on VPIC. And I think he phrased it well in plan participants and non-plan participants. You know, how these people appoint, are appointed to be on the committee is what is important to us. So that there is representation equally from both sides, both the employer and the employees. Uh, I would agree. The, uh, the governor having three picks is too many because it leaves just three coming from the employee side. The governor has got three and then the other employer representatives are there. So I don't know the best way to accomplish this and what the right number should be. Maybe 10 total isn't the right number to get to where we have the balance there should be. But that's the concern that we have. Other than that, we're pretty comfortable with the rest of this. Great, thanks. Any questions for Mike? Um, Steve? Good morning, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, Matt. I, am Chair. I freezing or is <laughs> and Steve? members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity. We're freezing, freezing. Is it me again, or is it Steve? It was Steve. It, it's not you. It's not Steve. You. It's Steve. Okay, so it's I'm frozen. Steve, you keep freezing up. Uh-oh. Still frozen. Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, let's try this. Hold on one second. You're okay now. There. Am I there? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, good. Thank you. I don't want to be frozen for long. That's for sure. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to testify um, on, and I, I'm um, going to limit my comments, obviously, to the governing uh, portion of the, the governance portion of the bill. Um, we're not that uh, far off from what you heard from uh, the NEA and from the BTA. Uh, for us, uh, you're going to hear a Oops. heated theme uh, on this section, on the next section, uh, about equity uh, and balance on these committees. Um, so uh, what the VSEA would prefer is that there be uh, an equal number of appointees from uh, the plans uh, to um, the folks who are not appointed by the plans. Um, <clears throat> however, you configure the folks who are not appointed by the plans. Really, we don't have a strong opinion about, um, but we think it should always be equal and balanced. And the reason for that is because, as the Boston College study did say, skin in the game does matter. Uh, I believe that study also said that the more, it may not be that study, but I certainly have heard Jeff testify uh, to this, that the more women you put on um, on investment boards, the better the performance. Um, so that, you know, the skin of the game does really matter. And, and I think that's something that's very, it's an important value. Uh, what we proposed in the House and our testimony in the House is that there be a six employee group appointments plus alternates and then six managers. And just to go to the chair's question, from the perspective of the state employees, anytime the governor appoints somebody, from our perspective, that is management appointing someone who they control. So whoever the governor may be, whoever she may be, if she appoints someone, that person is um, working for the manager and is there to represent the manager. And from our member's perspective, that is our, that is our member's boss, uh, regardless of what department you work in. Ultimately, all state employees work for the governor. Um, so that, I think that's, a, that's, that's just a concern. Um, right now, BPIC is, is pretty balanced. It's, it's three, you know, three folks from the plan and three folks who are not 
uh, on, on the board on any of the boards of the plan, of any of the plans uh, with the independent chair. We think that's fine. We don't really think that that, that you know governance. I'm sure had some influence on how the investment returns came out. Um, it, it really, I think, a lot of it. And I, I, I've heard the treasurer say this, and I, I hope I'm not saying anything she wouldn't confirm. A, a lot of the investment return um, results were things that were not in control of anything. Um, and and so it's it's a little a little bit of moving the chairs on the Titanic to say we have to we have to reconfigure the whole thing. And as the chair has said, as the chair of BPIC has said, we're doing quite well with the reforms that they have made. Um, so you know we we're not against making those changes, but we want to make sure that there's fairness and balance. Um, that that's the biggest thing. A couple of other small things. We respect the members of the General Assembly. We think they have expertise. Uh, we think they, as long as we have a citizen legislature, uh, we, we, should, we shouldn't be blocking out people who are either on uh, in the legislature and serving on VPIC or who are elected to the le legislature while they're serving on VPIC. Uh, certainly the folks who have the kind of skills that are, that are associated with members of VPIC we could use in state government in the state legislature. Um, so we don't think that's a, that's a real change that needs to be made. Um, we're okay with the independent VPIC, the study of uh, the independence of, of VPIC. And we just have, a, there was some language in there about a residency requirement, which I don't know if it survived in this, in this bill. Uh, I'd have to check on that. But I just, we did note in our original testimony that if members of the VSEA serve on any of these, serve on the V and the VSERS board and, and are, or are chosen to serve on VPIC, you know, we have a number of state employees who live out of state, some who live in Canada. Um, and so we don't want to disqualify anybody. I'm not sure how important that is, but I just thought it would, I would uh, point that out. Uh, we're okay with the more frequent experience study. Um, and then I don't know if you want to talk about, um, well, I think that goes into the next section. Um, it, uh, it says in my notes VPIC, but I think it, it's really about the task force. So I'll I think I'll just leave it there leave it there, that the really important thing for us is um, fairness and balance. And, and while I enjoy all of the references to the Boston College study, I would just say to you that that institution uh, gave me a degree. So I don't know if it says anything about their credibility, but you might- Oh, have, forget them. You know, <laughs> you might want to just factor that in. <laughs> so I, I do have a question for all of you. You've talked about employees and employers. Where do you put the treasure? The treasure is neither. Well, for our members, she's, she's an employer. We have members who work in the treasurer's office uh, who work for, who report to the treasurer. So she would be counted, much as we love her, she would be counted as a manager from our members' perspective. Okay. So when you talk about six employee representatives and six managers, you're including the treasurer in there and you're talking about um, 12 people and the chair. Yes, however you configure it. I mean, that's just how we testified in the house. That's what we thought made sense. But however you configure it, as long in our view, what's important is that the number of folks with skin in the game who were actually dependent on the outcome of these investments for their livelihood or their survival once they retire, that that number should be equal to the folks who, who, are, who, are, uh, who are not. Um, the folks chosen by the boards should be equal to the folks who are chosen by somebody else or appointed by the statute. Okay, even if the person chosen by the board is not, does not have skin in the game. Even if the person doesn't have skin in the game, yes, we think uh, the boards uh, should, uh, the, that there should be a balance there. Okay, all right. Any questions for Steve at this point, Senator Colomore? Thank you, Madam Chair. It's not actually for Steve. I, I feel a little bit like we're moving chess pieces around a table here. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to how similar the proposed VPIC composition of the board is when you compare it to similar states in terms of uh, the number of, of folks on the workforce and all that sort of stuff. 
Not that that's the super answer, because we don't always have to do what all the other states do, but I just want to try to get a general sense of how, how this compares to maybe other states with sort of similar size workforces. May, maybe Tom can answer that better than anybody. I don't know. You can probably at least try. You know, no states do it exactly the same way, um, but there are a number of states that do it similarly to Vermont, where you have a separate investment committee that focuses just on investments. And then you have underlying pension boards that handle the benefits and, and other more uh, appointee positions. In most states, it's really, particularly the ones that have investment focus, they try to emphasize the financial expertise versus employee versus employer group. So I think if you look at a lot of investment committees or commit commissions or whatever you, you call it, uh, it, it, it's more geared towards the investment side. And you also have to understand that we're fiduciaries for this trust. So no one comes to this board and tries to, and says, well, I'm wearing my hat as, a, as an employee or an employer. And, and we actually give our members fiduciary training, which we did this past uh, December. And that's one of the principles of being a fiduciary. You, you leave that hat outside the door. And your, your sole purpose as being a commissioner of this new entity will be to serve the beneficiaries of the plan. And sometimes you come up with difficult decisions and, and one of those would be the rate of return assumption. And that's why we've left it in this body because political influence could, could make that decision go either way. And we've tried to insulate it here at VPIC. I don't think you're gonna get one right answer. I think when you get more than 10 people though, it gets more difficult. And so I think that's why Beth and I recommended keeping it nine to 10 members, at least nine to 10 voting members. Um, you know, in regards to the governor's appointee, I know I, I heard that come up. The governor has two appointees right now out of a voting body of six. So that's 33%. He's getting three voting members if you count that the commissioner out of nine. So that's 30, you know, that's, that's 30%. So it's about the same, slightly less. So I think you really have to look at the voting members versus alternates and how this new structure is. So I, we tried to maintain equity in all of these interest groups. It's hard, um, but I, I think we've achieved pretty close balance to what the current VPIC is as our starting point. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. Thank you very much. Madam Chair uh, would, and Senator Collimer, would it be all right if I added to that? Sure. So I think that uh, when I looked at structures at other states, Maryland, for instance, did a very uh, extensive um, uh, study a few years back, 2018, I believe. Uh, what we see is uh, what, what I think generally what Thomas said, where you have a board um, that also has an investment committee, that you have that two-tiered structure, a little bit like what I saw in New Hampshire. And where you see the investment committee, you have um, a little bit more um, emphasis on uh, on professionals. I, I can't speak to the New Hampshire model because I have not looked at that uh, in any length, but I remember seeing that uh, uh, that organizational chart in the original uh, piece that uh, you folk, uh, the House looked at. Uh, so I think that that makes some sense. I would agree also that um, you know now we're talking about uh, I think twelve members. Uh, um, was that where we ended up with this uh, with um, uh, Steve's proposal? Twelve plus one or is it something in that range? Well, it's just 12. 12, okay. And I think you're starting to get a little large. The, the problem I have, the governor does have two plus one, as we said, it has two direct appointees and then a, the, the staff position. And it does say DFR. I don't know um, uh, how uh, Mike feels about that. I think in our, no offense to Mike, um, because I think he's exceptional and I wanna compliment what he's been doing also with, during the uh, COVID crisis. We had originally written that as the Department of Financial, uh, Commissioner of uh, Finance and Management, but uh, you know, um, that's that's up to you folks and that's up to you know um, the administration and how they feel there and uh, both are extraordinarily qualified. Uh, but I have a hard time figuring out how you would get a, a state employer representative uh, without that. Um, and I know that uh, Steve just qual uh, characterized me as a state employer. Um, I, um, um, I think that the treasurer um, is, is, is much more independent than, um, um, than uh, uh, someone that might be a, a, an employer member that's appointed, um, um, I'm gonna backtrack on that, appointed by the governor uh, as a staff position. But I think that, uh, you know, the intent was to have the treasurer as an independent uh, financial person who, who's looking at the uh, state finances as a whole. 
Um, but you know, those those points can be be seen in different ways, um, and I respect that. Um, but I, I do think there's balance here, and, and the committees that I've seen that are structured with that uh, board, uh, they do take an emphasis on the investments with their investment committees. Um, and there are several boards, uh, as Tom said, that totally um, um, separate uh, uh, investments from the uh, board activities as we're, uh, uh, we have. Uh, Prim comes to mind, um, Massachusetts Plan and SWIB, uh, I like the names, the State uh, Wisconsin Investment Board. Um, and uh, I think that um, spinoff is extraordinarily important there that, um, and having, having that independence. I know I'm kind of going off track to uh, Senator Colomer's question, so I'll stop there. Thank so um, I do have a, um, I, I want to jump right now and then go back to this issue, but I want to jump to Mike uh, Pichek, to the commissioner, being, um, of course, um, a superb um, commissioner here, being a Brattleboro boy and all. <laughs> <laughs> but um so Commissioner Pichek, if you could just tell us, when I read this and I said, why would the commissioner of DFR be on here? And maybe you can enlighten me about that. Well, um, it's a good question. I maybe had similar uh, questions myself uh, when the most re recent version of the bill uh, came out, but you know, I, I can't speak to the specific reason that we were included you know, on the house side. So. You know, I, I can't give you that answer. I can sort of make some um, points as to why you know DFR certainly has the general capabilities, and traditionally the DFR commissioner would have the capabilities of serving well on this committee. Um, you know, our department regulates the uh, the securities industry. We regulate the investment advisor broker dealer uh, communities. We often work with. Um, the SEC and FINRA on policy development, whether that's you know the fiduciary duty standard, whether it's um, you know other lesser important of policies. Uh, so we have great familiarity with the regulation and with the industry generally, and you know I think that background um, and knowledge certainly would be there regardless if it's me or a different commissioner in the future. So I think that's probably why um, we were selected. Would be my would be my guess. Okay, I guess that that helps me. Um, is Senator Clarkson. Uh, I think that the commissioner of DFR is is the has the most other than the treasurer, but I mean within the uh, administration is the commissioner with the most expertise uh, of both regulating uh, and securities. It, it makes ab I think it makes actually great sense to have the commissioner, uh, the DFR commissioner, as a member of this board. If we're looking to actually further uh, instill financial expertise in this board, which is so important to managing our pensions. Okay. Any other questions? Or uh, Karen, we have not heard from you yet. And th thank you, Commissioner. Um, I don't mean to dismiss you already, because, but you're <laughs> welcome to stay. But I, you answered my question, and um, I think it's just a matter of where we go. Great. Well, well thank you for inviting me, and uh, hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thanks. Bye. Karen? Thank you, Senator, and thank you for inviting us. Um, we had... Uh, a couple of questions around this. We did. We're we're not going to weigh in on the issue of um, what the relative balance needs to be on on the um, board. Uh, we do have, as it's written, um, one em member from Beamers and one employer rep from VLCT as part of the board. Um, just a couple of comments because a lot of um, these issues have been addressed already, but we we were struck, as was Jeff, by the chair serving not more than 20 years. That does sound um, extremely long, and uh, all, the, all the comments that he made regarding that kind of tenure um, uh, resonate with us. We've actually had that situation in the past on the VLCT board and had to change our bylaws to address it. <laughs> um, and then on, Page 13, I, I think 
and and this may be a question born out of lack of familiarity with um, femurs, even though I'm going to be using it sooner rather than later. Um, is what is what what's the actual relationship of this commission to the governing board? So Beamers has the five member governing board um, with the treasurer, two employee reps, and two employer reps, um, and uh, they've done quite a good job for municipal employees over the years. So. Uh, that may be a question for the treasurer, just to edify us a little bit. Madam Chair, is that, uh, would you like me to respond? Sure. So, so I, when you look at this, uh, again, back in 2000 and um, prior to 2003, the, the, the boards, the Municipal, State and Teachers Board were doing both investments and, um, and the benefit structures and, and, and administering the benefits of the plan. And what it resulted in was um, uh, some inconsistencies from board to board, as I said, different investment consultants, different asset allocations, although some of that would be appropriate when you look at the funded status, different investment managers doing the same thing. Um, and by combining the board and pooling, and then we, we eventually got to you know one investment manager in, in, in the appropriate space representing all three, that resulted in a reduction in fees because when you pool the assets, you get break points. You know, you get, let's say it's 20 basis points cost for the first uh, 50 million, it's uh, 15 basis points for the, uh, the, you know, the next uh, 100 million and so on. We took advantage of those and as I say, you had a million dollars of fee reduction the first year. So I think that uh, uh, separating the two, um, um, as long as the boards get to, to appoint somebody and have a voice in that, uh, make some sense. Uh, and uh, we see that those specialties are very, very different. And different sections of our office support that. The benefits are supported by the retirement division and the investments are supported um, by the, um, uh, the investment staff uh, 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 working um, uh, with uh, Eric Henry. And then you get uh, uh, my time and Michael Clausen's time, my deputy and others proportioned across all of those depending on what we do. So they're supported by different groups in the office because of the very the expertise. And, uh, and again, as long as these boards have the ability to, um, uh, to appoint a member, and although people get uh, talked a lot about uh, the report on attendance, and you know that's uh, and I, I the reason that that is there is so that uh, in the training is so that the boards can keep an eye on their investment um, 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 representative to make sure they are in fact attending the meetings and taking the requisite training, um, so they get that report once a year. It's not intended to be the investment report. We got. Uh, uh, a multitude of reports. We have performance reports, we have actuary reports, we have experience study reports, we're adding fee reports on uh, those things, but we think that that particular report just lets, the, uh, lets them know, uh, gives them a, you know, are they attending the meetings? Are they doing their job? If somebody's been uh, attended four out of 12 meetings, you might want the board to have a conversation about that. And, uh, and if they've done no training over the last five years, um, that would be a problem that uh, the board might want to rectify in its next appointment. And thank you, Treasurer. Um, and, and one other sort of, I guess, similar question um, regarding the reports on every year uh, after 2022, this is on page 13, the commission submits the House and Senate Committees on Government Operations report on performance of each plan. Um, what, what does the... Uh, House and Senate Government Operations Committee do with those reports? What are they gonna do with those reports? Like would they have the capacity to override the decision-making of the other governing boards? In, in terms of the investments or the benefits? Or, I mean, it, what do you mean override? Take, take different action than the governing boards might have proposed or wanted to take. Um, Senator Polina, do you want, did you have it? Yeah, well, it seems like the report would be of decisions already made. So we, would, we couldn't go back in time and change those decisions anyway. 
I had thought, and I could be wrong, but I had thought that the purpose of that was so that we could keep on top of what's going on. Yeah. So we don't all of a sudden find out 10 years from now that we've been falling behind for 10 years and nobody told us the sort of situation we're in. So I thought it was just to keep an eye on where things are going and maybe voice our opinion from time to time. But it would be too late to change those decisions. It might give us an indication of what decisions we've made in the future, but it'd be more to kind of keep tabs on how things are going. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. That's that's helpful. So um those were really um, all the comments that, that we had on the bill um, right now. Thank you. Thank you. So I, in looking at this, I see that there, there I think there are a couple things that we, um, I'm gonna try and pull us to a, a, some kind of action here on some things if there are. We need to add some language around the qualifications of the chair, around financial expertise, leadership ability, wh whatever we think should be in there. And um, <coughs> we, can, we can work on that. Then we need to um, look at the 20 year uh, term, which does seem to me pretty long also. Yeah, um, and I know it's twenty years and both, so you could be twelve years as a member of VPIC and then eight years, the way it looks, as a as the chair. So that's the twenty years. But twenty years is anyway. So that's another um, area that we need to look at. Yeah, and uh, clarify that the chair is not uh, is not a voting member. And then um, we have the, the issue of the balance. Are, is that, have I captured where we are, Senator Clarkson? No? I have other, oh no, th those, those are all the points I have. Uh, we also, there was a question about uh, the language of intent from the treasurer and the written policies. Uh, and the written then, policies. Yeah, written policy. And then we have um, the proposals that, that uh, are in a memo there are additional proposed amendments that the treasurer and um, and the chair have suggested to us, which is a, a fairly longish memo that we should take a peek at. But I don't think they've included all their recommendations for amendments in this testimony so far. Have you? Have you? Well, that was a me let me give some clarifying, if I may. Okay. Because I, I, uh, I that this that was a memo good. we gave to House Gov Ops. That just oh, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. I thought they that did. Was I think they incorporated most, if not all, of those. In oh, the okay. okay. Yeah. I, that wasn't. I, I wasn't. I didn't read. The, I just thought that was for us. No. Sorry. Okay. Again, comment on that. I think the one big issue that w remained was the, uh, the the definition of independence and whether that uh, um, created. Um, uh, some exclusion of folks, uh, so we, we 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 would recommend taking a look at that. Um, there's one other thing that I, I wanted to point out that I think is very helpful. Uh, getting to your point, uh, Senator Polina, uh, the investment reports are available on our webpage back to 2005, and the actuarial reports back to 2001 on a quarterly basis. So you, you do get to see that. And I think that it's great to, to send that to you folks. But I think it's more important to send it to all the members. And one of the things we had in the in the um, in the um, uh, the proposal was that we would send some type of not necessarily a document, but maybe a link um, to a dashboard with all the relevant information for, for, our, for our members. Um, so that, uh, now um, I, I would say that not everybody that's a member is probably an expert on investments um, or an expert on actuarial science. Uh, as I'm not an expert on engineering, you would not want me building a bridge for instance. Um, but uh, I think that it's helpful for them to see that uh, they already get an annual benefit statement, so they, they understand that. And we just went live a few months back. Uh, I want to thank um, um, our retirement division with a um, an online product that lets you go on and take a look at your benefits. So maybe that's a place where we could put that uh, dashboard. But I think that that would be very helpful. And one more question, getting to the point of what would you do with that data? I think it's informative and, you, and ask questions, but I would think it would be a very, very dangerous thing um, for uh, for someone to suggest that uh, 
that the legislature should um, uh, dictate investments. That's why you have a committee. Why you'd be in trouble? Uh, I mean, trouble. We'd all be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You I mean, can't. We're, a, we're a citizen legislature. Ask my banker about my financial <laughs> acumen. I'm not, uh, going there. I'm not going there, Madam Chair. Okay, Jeff. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Polina, you had a. Well, that's okay. Well, okay. I'll just be brief. I just think the dashboard idea and giving information to all the members is a good idea. I would just really plead that it be do, done in plain English so that people can actually understand it and not be like annual reports we get from companies that we own stock in or you don't understand it and you can't read the writing because the font's too small and whatnot. And you might also want to look at providing it in more than just English in other languages as well. That's all great suggestions, sir. And uh, we, we will bring those back to our staff because um, we would agree that um, uh, it's just good suggestions. Thank you, sir. Sure. Jeff, did you have a... Yeah, just to, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I appreciate the conversation and sometimes that sparks thoughts and uh, it, it uh, goes back to what Senator Rahm said early on, which is, you know, there was some conversation earlier about um, how the, 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 the current structure of VPIC is uh, three three employees, if you will, and four others. So it's seven, if you will, and the tr is three and three and, and the chair uh, is, is Tom Galanka, as we know. And and so that we heard a lot of discussion earlier with Representative Gannon, who's not here now, but about how they changed course recently and have been doing better and better and, and appreciated all that good work and adjustments they've made, which then gets back to Senator Rahm's question, which is, I'm not sure what problem we genuinely are trying to fix here. Um, and it, it, I get it. We want more export experts, and and we want better independence, and and uh, we want to share the reports with uh, with plan participants, and and a lot of that can be done right now without statutory fix. Um, and we and so I just I'm left with a feeling here. Of, I, I'm not sure what problem we are genuinely trying to fix by adjusting the current structure of VPIC and the good work that we all. Have said is happening. So I'm left with that thought, and and I don't have an answer to Representative Rahm's question either. I saw Senator, Tom, Senator Rahm's. I'm sorry. <laughs> I saw Tom raise his hand. Thanks, Madam Chair. Originally, when they made the initial proposal, I thought the same thing. You know, what, um, why change what's working? But I think you got to compare this. You know. VPIC has changed so much over the past couple of years. And, and my goal really when I took over as chair was to basically make us more professional and make us more, not necessarily independent for the treasurer, but work in collaboration with the treasurer's office. And so I view this as an opportunity to basically get us to the next step. I don't really view it as a negative, these changes. The numbers aside, whether it's three here or two there, I think they're generally the same. You know, I, I know you can argue one or the other, but I think these changes will allow for internal staff to own the investment choices better and to provide better advice for the ultimate board. And I think the person to hear from really would be Eric Henry in this regard. And because I think he's brought in a level of in, uh, institutional investment knowledge that I'd like to sort of, you know, become standard going forward. You know, you look at how much we spend out of state for investment management fees for the $5.4 billion that we invest in. It's 20 plus, billion, 20 plus million dollars a year. And we're paying only 360,000 on our internal staff, you know, what I would like to see is just this internal staff maybe taking more control, becoming more professional and utilizing our dollars that we are spending in a better way to increase performance. And so I guess Eric can talk to the staffing and how that can benefit VPIC, but Beth's been tremendously supportive. Our fear is that without Beth, it could go either way. You could get a treasurer in there that, that doesn't believe in DB plans, that wants to scrap the whole thing. And we'd have a very difficult time managing these funds. Conversely, you could have a, the other side of the equation that could be advocating for use of these funds that wouldn't be appropriate, um, that could harm investment returns. And so the issue of independence to me is the most critical. It's not necessarily the, the staffing or the numbers in equity. I think it's the, the idea that we've grown up enough that we can work more collaboratively, collaboratively with Beth. And I think Eric would be great to sort of um, expand on these ideas. Okay. Chair, may I make a comment? Yes, please do. 
the record, Eric Henry, I'm Chief Investment Officer, and uh, technically I report to the treasurer on her staff, but I spend the bulk of my time working with the committee. At the beginning of this hearing, you asked me whom I was representing, and I paused because I don't really distinguish between my role working with the committee and working with the treasurer. It's so seamless right now. We've been able to collaborate to achieve a lot of good over the last two and a half years. We've lowered fees. We've avoided some major losses. We've streamlined the portfolio. We've made it easier for the small staff to oversee. And, and our concern is not how it's working now. The concern is what happens after Treasurer Pierce. Uh, Tom mentioned a, a, a few things uh, that the next Treasurer might not be supportive of funding the DB plan, might not be supportive of preserving the DB plan not uh, be as, as uh, beholden to her fiduciary duty as the current treasurer is. And beyond that, longer term, having the staff report to an independent committee, much like we have in Massachusetts or Wisconsin or Montana or a number of other states with this structure, having the staff report to an independent committee makes it easier to attract and retain talent from an investment standpoint. The reason for that is that the talent that you're attracting, whether it's a CIO or a deputy CIO or analysts or entry level investment people, they're not subject to the whims of a, a, political, uh, a political nominee. Those political offices turn over, those, trans, those personalities change. And the concern is that uh, when you're trying to attract and retain talent, you want to keep them around for a long time longer than one treasurer, longer than two treasurers, because these investment programs, they take a long time to implement and a long time to build. And if you're changing direction from an investment standpoint every couple of years, it's very disruptive, it's very inefficient, it costs a lot of money and fees and lost returns. So our view is that this, uh, having a separate committee to oversee it to, to attract, attract and retain the staff is a best practice, not only for participants of the plan because they get more continuity in who's overseeing their portfolio, but for the taxpayers because there's a more consistent long-term plan to the portfolio. Um, Madam Chair, I just want to point out that I'm not leaving, uh, not planning on leaving anytime soon, um, but uh, just thought I'd point that out. Um, but uh, in addition to that, I agree the politics could get in, involved, you know, depending on who's the governor, who's the treasurer. Um, Tom pointed out a really good um, um, uh, issue, which is that um, some treasurers have said we need to do more local investment and in the process, and those are good things. We do local investments uh, in our office. We've got a great um, uh, local investment uh, committee that said in the pension fund, you know, when, if you start to do some of that without looking at the, um, at the investment uh, criteria that we use to select managers, you can get yourself in a whole lot of trouble. And uh, I could go down um, a, a, a list of um, of sole trustees and trustee um, and investment co committees that have made those mistakes, and it's um, it's not good to be able to report uh, have report those losses uh, to um, uh, to to uh, the, the taxpayers. Uh, and again, uh, professionalizing the staff, they need to be independent. We're at that point now. You know, a few years back, the cost probably was prohibitive. You know, we did not have the staff when I first started as a deputy treasurer. We had one investment. CIO, and we wouldn't did, actually didn't call uh, the person that we called the person, the director of investments in debt. And um, in that case, he managed the debt for the state, the debt issuance, he managed the investments. And because he was supposed to have so much spare time, he also managed the bond bank. Okay, which uh, so one third of his time presumably was related to the uh, the uh, to the investments of, of three different boards at the time. You know, we uh, we 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 spun off the, uh, the the bond bank back to uh, being an independent group. That was a good move. So now his time is half between debt and investments. Um, and uh, by the way, I keep saying he because we have a lot of he's in there. I'd love to see a lot of she's in this group as well. Um, but. Um, um, uh, then, then now we've moved to a director that uh, is entirely in investments, although uh, Eric would tell you that he does some work on our deferred comp and, uh, and uh, some of our other um, uh, accounts, and we would look to, um, to move that to other staff uh, so that he can concentrate solely on, invest, uh, on the VPIC moving forward. So it's been an evolution. This is the next step in evolution, as all of us have said many times, and I'll stop saying it again, and it takes politics or the potential for politics uh, down the road. Um, and you know, I've been doing this for 40 years, but you don't see too many treasurers that uh, have 40 years of uh, cash management and investment and finance experience. Um, 
uh, hopefully the next one, many, many years down the road again, uh, we'll have those same experiences. Senator Clarkson. Uh, thank you, Beth. We, we feel the same way. Don't go anywhere fast, except maybe to Springfield to get those. Um, the cannolis. The cannolis. Yeah. We're, we're still waiting for those. Uh, <laughs> I'll get those for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, I've been thinking about balance. And uh, mm -hmm. I think how I view the, uh, what you call, Jeff, the participants, non-participants, the third leg of this stool is, of course, the taxpayers of Vermont. Mm -hmm. The taxpayers uh, uh, are participating in helping finance this. Yes. And so I, I would say I view the, the other, the non-union members as being the, the other balance, which is the taxpayer. And I, I think it's completely fair for us to be considered. I have, you know, I have, I, I'm very independent of all this, of all the things that we've talked about and sadly independent of a lot of financial expertise as well. But I am a taxpayer and I have a vested interest in how these pensions do and, and how sustainable they are. So I think as we look at balance, we also need to remember the taxpayer as a key piece of this balance. Um, Senator, I would absolutely agree with that. If you take a look at the employer representatives that, uh, that we're looking at, uh, one from the School Board Association and one from the Vermont League of Cities, they're representing their constituencies that are part of this. And um, uh, whether it's uh, DFR or, or, or finance and management, I think that they are as well. Um, and again, I, I'm having a hard time figuring out how you would uh, uh, appoint a member to be the employer representative for the state um, that um, uh, uh, that would uh, be other than um, um, an, a, an employee of the state because we don't, um, um, that's, that's, the, that's the plan itself. And, uh, but that said, I think that you're absolutely right, uh, employers. Now, this plan is for the benefit of the uh, members of the system. And under IRS code, that's very clear that uh, we make decisions for the benefit of the, um, of the, of, of the members of the system. Um, but I think they go uh, hand in glove on this. And uh, the reality is that uh, uh, maximizing your investment return um, is in the best interest of the members. And it happens to be in the best interest of the taxpayer as well. But if I'm looking at this, if someone's asking you know, that we should do some action uh, that um, uh, we would think contrary to, um, to good investments uh, without naming any in the past, uh, what I would say there is that um, um, we would not want to be compelled to do that um, um, with a lot of pressure uh, or members that are, again, more political. Uh, so uh, that would be the balance. I'm having a hard time, and I'm certainly willing to talk about you know, how, how that two plus one, that uh, ex officio state employee would work. I think that that's something you should probably have some more discussion on, but I think it's important uh, to have an empl uh, a, a balance. Three, essentially um, um, having that uh, third, mem uh, third member somehow representing the employers. And maybe there's a few workarounds on that. Um, um, uh, I'm thinking of one, um, uh, and I'm doing this off the cuff, but maybe the employer members of the board, the state board, elect a, um, uh, an employer representative, which could be the, uh, a member of the board, or like in the other cases, uh, the, um, uh, the, um, um, a, a member, uh, someone with investment expertise that they would want to, to select. So maybe that's a way, it's not a gubernatorial appointment, uh, this this is off the cuff. So as I'm saying this, I know that I'm going to have some folks say, but you forgot about this, but you forgot about this and and all that along the way. But maybe the employer members, which would include the the, um, uh, the commissioner of finance, it would include um, um, the commissioner of human resources. Uh, those are the two. And perhaps uh, I don't know whether you would want the treasurer, because, again, I uh, I bristle at the idea of, you know, um, that I'm representing employer or employer. I think I'm both. Um, but uh, and I think I'm nonpartisan. But that might be a solution uh, to this is that uh, if the employee members are selecting the employee, maybe the employer rep, um, representative is uh, and they would have to um, uh, uh that would, that would be a, a thought in this. And again, this is off the cuff and I'm sure that um, uh, Tom, Eric, uh, Representative Gannon, uh, maybe the three um, employee representatives that we have today are all gonna say, but you forgot about this, but there are solutions. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to, there are some things that I think we can decide 
right now. We want a written, we want written policies. Yes. We um, want some uh, to write in some qualifications for the chair. Okay. Have we? Yeah. And, and we think that 20 years might be too long. Yes. And I don't know what the answer to that is, but it seems to me, I don't want us to keep, uh, at some point we have to start making some decisions. And I believe, and I think that the issue of the balance is probably the one that's gonna take the most discussion. So I'd like us to leave that alone for right now and may see if we can make decisions on the other issues. Well, is, Madam yes. Chair. Yes. Uh, I, I hesitate to say this, but the bill is not actually formally voted out of the House yet. So you know, I, I have some concerns about our making final decisions before we see the final bill. Um, I don't know that we will ever see a final bill. And I'm, I'm trying to be um, to figure out here the timing and what we're going to do, because the um, the suggestion is that we may want to come to some decisions and put it in the budget bill. If we do that, we have to have it done. We can't wait. They're not even going to vote it out of the out of the house until a week from Friday. That's right. And so we have to have this done by we, Friday. We or, have to have we have to have this done by next week, whether, regardless of what the house does. And I hate to say that, but um, that that's just the reality of of where we are, I think. If anybody disagrees with that, let me know. Um, that but we don't have time to have a House bill come to us, then make changes, then send it back to the House. Right, no, it I- It won't I, happen I, this year. I, I realized that, I just, yeah, I was, okay. So that's why I'm, if they get a bill out to us tomorrow, then we can change whatever decisions we've made. But I'd like us to try and get rid of some of the issues that we've been talking about so that we can focus on the other issues without constantly kind of um, going off in ta on tangents. So. Madam Chair. Yes. So ju just a couple of things I wanted to say. One, I I'm not sure if you're talking about setting aside balance on both VPIC and I'm, not, I'm talking, we're only talking about governance right now. We're still we're just talking about governance. Okay. okay. Just governance. We're not talking about the task force at all today. Okay. So we're, I didn't know if you meant this week or what, what we're talking about. So for tomorrow, today, we're talking, we'd like to try and make some decisions about governance. Yes. And, and the, the things that I think we can all agree that Jeff's suggestion about having written policy is good. Mm -hmm. okay. If I could just say before we move on, I don't, mean for this to sound like some kind of principal stance in opposition to Senator Clarkson, but I just want to say, you know, educators and state employees are taxpayers, they're paying into this plan, and they are, you know, working for decades to have some retirement at the end. So they're investing in a lot of different ways in the outcome of this, uh, of this fund. And so I just, I, I don't think we can move on without that being said. Yeah, no, no I, I agree, but I don't want to talk about balance now. Okay, please. I, I, I don't mean to get excited here, but can we please come to some decisions about some of the things that we seem to agree on and then go back and talk about the balance issue and where we might be with that? Because yeah. if, we, if we keep on kind of going off, we're never going to get anywhere and we have to be done with this by Friday. Okay, that, I mean that's the bottom line. We're, or we we're won't. Getting, we're right it here. Won't happen this year. You're keeping us very focused. I don't think we've actually gone off on any tangents. You've kept. Well, going. I just want us to focus now. Written policy. Okay, are we okay with that? Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Twenty years. Is that too much? Yeah. Too much. Okay. What should it be? Twelve. Tom, what are the others? The others are twelve. Tom. Since I'm probably the only one with experience being both an alternate, a member, and now chair, I think I'm uniquely qualified to answer this question. I think uh, I think the role of the chair is significantly different from a member or an alternate. So I think if you're going to have alternate, or if you're going to have chair limits, 
you should decouple service from either of the other roles. And the reason I say that is because an alternate is like sort of training. So I also think you should decouple alternate roles from the other term limit, but that's a different issue. Um, I think that's where you run into problems because it okay. takes a while to go from alternate to member to chair. And then if you limit them, you may have, if you, if, if 12 years had been in place when you first started, I'd be off next year, or two years from now. So I think that's one comment. And the second comment on this you should think about is this position already has a, a, a out clause for all existing members. It's not a set term you have. It's an at will employee basically of the nine other members. So they already have an out clause. And by limiting a future board from be able, being able to make a decision on who they want to represent them, take me out of the picture. I think it's very limiting from a board as they get closer and closer to that term limit. So that's an argument for not having term limits for the chair and just striking it completely. Um, I do like term limits because I think it does offer, offer transition. But I also have served on boards where you don't want to limit board options, particularly if they get someone, say, 10 years from now or whatever, say you get Warren Buffett or you get somebody else that you want to have able to, to represent you. You always have the ability to get rid of them from, with a six-person vote. So I'll leave it at that. So did, did I understand you to say that you, you, could, you should also decouple members and alternates so that yeah. members have a three, three term limit? That's, that's, how the the house bill ha that's how the House bill has it now. Um, no, they have members and alternates have three term limits, which yeah. means that if you're an alternate, you couldn't have your three terms and then become a member. The, so you're saying decouple it and have... Yeah. I, don't, I, I first don't think members should be limited by the service they had as an alternate. First of all, they don't get a vote. Right, right. That's yeah. so that we need to we need to change that then. Yes, so that that's, that's members have a, members have a three term limit. Alternates have a three term limit as an alternate, but then they can become a a member. Yes. And then they would have another three term limit. No, but then they'd be serving for 24 years. I'm sorry, that's just way too long for anybody. Well, I think if you're an I, alternate, you're not voting. You're tra You're in training. Okay. Yeah, I would I, argue that the alternate role makes sense to limit it to, or, or count against the, don't count against one of their terms against a regular voting member. So if you're an alternate for more than one term, you're only you're not, you're not, and then you become a voting member because that's that natural pattern. You, you're yeah. alternate for a year or two or three, and then you start to become a voting member as a regular member. So if you exclude one term from an alternate being as counted in their years of service, I think that would accomplish, it would limit an alternate from being to serve to 16 years instead of what you're saying, 24 years um, in that scenario. Yeah, just, just limit the first term because that's really the, the practice that I'm seeing um, an alternate serves for a couple of years and then they become a voting member. Um, uh, so that I think would address that. In terms okay. of, I wouldn't count service as a member or an alternate in terms of chair, because I think you're, you're really gonna limit, limit yourself for future uh, chair service. So you would just take out the term limit for the chair completely and just leave it? I would, I would recommend that, but if you need it, if you wanna have a chair a limit, exclude past service as alternate member. So, and then set your year number off of that. So I do one of the two. If, if you leave a term limit, make sure it's not coupled with the service as an alternate or a regular member, and then set that, that year number that you, you see fit or get rid of it altogether because it really is a position that can be eliminated tomorrow by six votes. Committee? I'd have to think about it. I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I mean, this has just been proposed, so I'd really yep. like to have, think about it. Yep, Senator Rahm. Okay, so I, you can just tell me we can't introduce new fact patterns here, but what I still have, I've asked about in the past, I'm not quite sure about is Tom, it sounded like you received very little compensation and I'm wondering how many hours you put in and how feasible it is for someone to serve as chair if they're not kind of retired or affluent or like, how, how does this work where someone could serve for 20 years and not really even get paid? Well, we do, they do pay me some, a third of the salary of the treasurer. So it does, 
Okay. It does help in that. You know how many hours I've spent on it over the past three weeks? I'd say it's been a full-time job. Oh. I anticipate this transition period away from the treasurer's office is going to make this job even more important. And so that's why I wouldn't limit it. I'd, I'd err on the side of caution and not limit it right out the start. Um, you can always add some term limitation for a chair, I would imagine. Um, but it, I envision this position to be more become like an executive director position. Okay. And it, it sort of guides it. Some models have states where the executive director uh, controls both investments and then benefits. So you theoretically could spin off the benefits side and some states do that, but not now. I'm not suggesting that, but the, the, that could be the role this becomes. M Madam Chair. Yes. I, I didn't, I guess I just missed it in this bill. I didn't see that we had specific compensation identified yeah. the chair. And I would assume that the chair would be paid as a full-time professional. We're asking no. for you know, the chair is paid thir a third of the salary of the treasurer. It's in here, and but I think that I, I, I think that when we look at the independent consultant that is being hired, one of the things they're going to be looking at is the compensation of the commission chair and commission employees. I don't think we have to make that decision now. I think that's going to come in the report from the consultant. Yeah, right, we're okay. going to come up with a report on that. Yes. Good. That needs to be reviewed. Big test. Yes. Well, it, it will be because it's in the it's in here as what they have to look at. Okay. So committee, I, I'm happy just taking out the the um, term limit entirely for the commissioner for the chair. Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I agree with Tom. If you serve one year, and forgive my uh, mixing metaphors here, but if you serve one term as a junior varsity member, it counts against your varsity status when you get there so that you could only serve two. I think that's basically what you said, correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay, and I agree with the chair that uh, we'll just take the, uh, the term limits off the chair. Senator Clarkson? I think if we're, I am a big supporter of limits, term limits. Um, and um, so I, I would be happy to rethink, uh, I think 20 years is too long and, and I'm happy to take Tom's thoughts into consideration, but if we're doing term limits for the rest of the board, uh, I absolutely think that we should be looking at a, a, a term limit. I, I really think that it's too long to serve at the head of any organization is, uh, you know, I'm just, I, I just, I, I just think that's too long to serve uh, as a as the head of an organization and it needs to be uh you know i just think it needs to be shaken up a bit i just don't i, I just don't see that so i i'd have to i need to think about that to okay all right so, yes Ram. i mean i think as as long as there's a one to three year review of the chair and there's really strict protocols for conflict of interest or misconduct of some sort I think that's what counts more than the length of time overall. We currently have an annual review and Beth can attest to that. Um, we handle, have it every December. And are, are issues of misconduct, et cetera, in the bylaws or are those all in statute? We have our ethics policy that we agree to. Uh, that's part of the new policies that we're looking to add in or, or strengthen under a new VPIC that's separate from the treasurer staff. So I anticipate that that would be a priority that we'll work on. And we've been talking a lot about ethics in this committee. If there's some kind of ethical violation that's currently found, does that give the other board members the ability to review the service of the chair or what happens if there's an ethical violation? Um, Madam, uh, Senator, um, Tom leaves the room when we, uh, when we evaluate him and then he gets the feedback. Um, but uh, we, we would look at that. It hasn't happened and I can't, re we call a member, but every year we have we we review our policies as well. Uh, we have a conflict of interest policy. We have a um, an ethics policy, uh, training policy on on what type of training you can have and who who pays for it. And uh, and last, uh, we have a disclosure that we do each year, you know, to to certify we have no conflict of interest. If something were to happen, the board, as Tom just pointed out, or the committee, excuse me, would have the ability to uh, say um, see ya. 
um, you know, that this is, and they could do that at any time because um, uh, t um, the chair serves at the pleasure of the committee. If a staff person had that problem, we, we would deal with that immediately. Um, and uh, members are required to disclose any conflicts as well. Um, and I think that that's so, we, and they, there are repercussions for the members uh, in terms of their ability to vote for a particular investment manager or something like that. But I think that that's something we would want to take a little further look at as we, we go forward in terms of what recourse you have uh, as we develop that policy. But um, um, that review is seriously considered. It's part of our annual review of investment managers. I mean, excuse me, investment consultants, our custodian, and, uh, and Tom is a, is a key member um, and essentially an employee of the group. Not well paid, but an employee. So um, I- Anthony has a- Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Polina. Well, I just wanted to say, just wanted to say that I, I feel uncertain about this question of term limits. So I'm sort of in the Senator Clarkson field right now. I mean, I just want to think on it a little bit. I see both sides, and I've been listening, but I, I don't have a firm opinion right now. Fair enough. Fair enough. So I I don't I have think I have to leave in fifteen have, minutes for a chair's have, meeting. We have, we have twelve minutes. But you can keep on if you want. And I think that I didn't quite understand Beth's comment about redefining the independent. I don't know if you meant the independence of the, or if you were saying that they, they did it in the house, they redefined. I, I, I'm, I, I don't want us to deal with the way the bill was as it was introduced and then go from there. I want us only to look at what is in front of us now, because that's, it gets confusing here about what changed in the house, because we don't really care. I, I shouldn't say we don't really care, but we don't, because we have in front of us what we have in front of us. And so like Senator Clarkson's confusion with all the amendments, she thought they were for us, but they weren't, they were for the house. So. I don't know if you said, meant, Beth, that we had to redefine independent person or the independence of the council, or if you were talking about how they changed it from the way it was introduced to the way we have it. And you're muted. Sorry about that. I think we'd like to look at the independence of the um, of the uh, the members, uh, the employee member, employer members, for instance, and uh, and the experts that they um, that uh, whether they have a conflict, whether a relative is in um, uh, oh, that is in the definitions. Yeah. Are you saying we need to relook at the definitions? I think we want to make sure. I think I'd like to have an opportunity uh, with uh, Tom and Eric to take one more look at that and and make sure there aren't any unintended consequences. You know, uh, we have, um, uh, uh, I'm not trying to be, uh, uh, we have legislators who are, um, are um, uh, also retirees. And we have um, different folks that have, di you know, you folks go through a process of looking to see if you have any, any conflicts or independence. So I think it would be helpful for us to take one more look at that. We'll do that in the next day. We won't, we won't hold you up. Yeah, if you have changes in the definition of independent person, then mm -hmm. we need to know what those are. I yeah. think they changed it. They changed it for our biggest concern, which okay. was excluding um, member spouses from working for a school district, and it would exclude them from participating. Yeah. So I think that's out of the current bill. But I, but it is helpful that the language is a little legalese, and it's sometimes hard to follow. But I, we can take one more pass at it. Yeah, take one more look at it, and then get back to us. And whatever changes they made before, we don't care about. And then, and then we need to look at. Um, the balance. And I'm going to uh, suggest that if, if uh, you all want to keep talking about that, you can do it as long as you want. I have to leave at four, at whatever time that is, 3.30. 3.30. For a chair's meeting, which I don't really want to go to, but because um, I think I'd rather stay here and have this discussion, but I'm going to throw in my one comment about balance. I, I understand the, the need to um, make sure that this is a balanced thing, but the term negotiation was used. And on the VPIC board, 
that deals with investments, I don't think it's an issue of negotiation. The, the um, employee representatives should have the same goal as the employer re representatives to do the make the best investments possible for the beneficiaries. And I don't think that um, if you, you can't start having sides on an investment board, as I see it, you need to all be devoted. I was the president of United Way for a while. And one of my favorite members of the board was David Dean. And he, there were right-wing Republicans, left-wing Democrats, and everything in between on that board. And what he used to say was when we come into this United Way board meeting, we check our political hats at the door. We do not bring them in with us. We're looking at the best thing for United Way of Wyndham County and for our residents. So I, I don't see the issue of balance here as a negotiation. It might be a little bit different on the, on the task force, but here I, I don't see that. But anyway, that's my parting thought. Senator Clarkson. So my parting question for Tom is, do you actually have a value of consensus decisions on the VPIC? Do you agree to consensus on the VPIC? Most, def most definitely. I guess to my answer that I, I've never had a point where I had to break a tie in the five years. So uh, we really take advice from our hired experts, whether it's our investment staff. And that's where we've been moving more towards, where we take more advice from our staff to, to counterbalance the investment advice we get from our consultant. And so... We have discussions and disagreements over certain investments, but at the end of the day, it becomes a consensus decision right. 99% so of the time. That's a value you employ. That's right. Yeah. That, that's, that's important, I think, in as we think about this. Yeah. So, committee, do you, are you, yes, Anthony, Senator Polina. I don't think it makes sense for the committee to stick around if you and Senator Clarkson are both gonna leave. It just seems like we could use our time otherwise. Oh, well, you might make some really good decisions with us. <laughs> yeah, then we'd have to change them, right? <laughs> no. Just um, kidding. So we have this on again tomorrow from 1.30 to whenever we end, okay? Okay. So tomorrow, <coughs> what I like to do, I think, is start with the um, task force conversation. That'll give us time to, for uh, Beth and Tom to relook at the definition of independence. It'll give us time to look at the issue of uh, term limits for the chair and kind of cogitate on it for a little while, and then, um, and then at the end of the discussion on the um, task force then we can come back to this issue because then maybe we'll have some language from Tom. I'll get to Amarin and have her um, uh, come up with some language around the qualifications for the chair. And I guess, Tom, if you would like to help her with some language around qualifications for the chair, just to put something in here. Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay, and then, um, and, and we'll add Jeff's little written word in there. Thank you, Jeff, for something that was somewhat simple to make a decision on. You're welcome. It, it's small. And just so you know, I, I've heard rumors that the House Appropriations Committee is, to, to the point that was discussed earlier, maybe considering two or three amendments to this bill as you, yeah, as you were. My, my point is like, wait, let's see what they include too. Yeah, well, and we'll take that up, but we- yep, and, and, and we'll know what their amendments are tomorrow. So, and we're listening to our appropriations committee. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna do what they tell us to do. <laughs> so does that make sense, everybody, to do it that way? Sure, sure. And then if there are other issues that come up between now and then, I guess um, it would be good maybe for us to to uh, get those listed so that we can then have some answers both on the task force question and on the governance question. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.